Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm Nikki Eisenhower, your host, life coach, and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm exploring the difference between mindfulness and hypervigilance. One of the hard truths of healing from a dysfunctional childhood is that many of us have lived a lifetime of hypervigilance. If we've lived a lifetime of hypervigilance, it can be very confusing to consider what it is to live outside of that hypervigilance. And our hypervigilance really seems smart to those of us who have been in survival mode over the course of a lifetime. And it feels not smart to put that hypervigilance down because we don't know how to feel safe when in a relaxed state. So the core issue there is this belief that becomes this undercurrent of how we live. That we believe from a wounded core place that we should always be hyper aware and on guard to be able to take care of ourselves. And that winds up backfiring by exhausting us, not just in the emotional sense, but in the physical sense, by keeping our system actually and truly fatigued. And that's not a winning strategy over the course of a lifetime. What I notice in working with highly sensitive people is that we can often try to use mindfulness strategies through a lens of hypervigilance. And that's why I want to do this episode today, to try to talk through and shine light on those of you that are using hypervigilance through mindfulness in a way that I don't believe will serve you. And it's tricky to do because the hypervigilant state has a whole lot of feeling to it. And it's hard to put those feelings into words. All of us who are healing are in a different relationship with our bodies. You may have done enough healing in your life if you've lived a lifetime of hypervigilance to have moments of feeling very present. The opposite of hypervigilance is to be present, to be embodied. When we are hypervigilant, we are on guard. So we can't use the tool of mindfulness if we're continuing to be on guard, if that makes sense the way that I'm describing it. So let me try to break down what is mindfulness as a strategy, as a mindset versus what is hypervigilance as a state, as a strategy, as a way of being so that we can move away from hypervigilance over time and towards a mindful existence. Because when we are mindful, we are at more peace and more presence. We are more embodied. Many of you follow my work because you recognize that you have all this head knowledge. You have read so many books. You have listened to so many podcasts. You have gone to so many therapy appointments. And the healing is not available to us only through the realm of the head. Something is missing when we don't know how to make that head knowledge become our body's knowledge, our heart knowledge. When we do that, we get the relief that we're seeking. So even if you've never had a moment of not hypervigilance, I want you to ride this episode with me today by offering this possibility that there is a way of being that can be more mindful, more enjoyable, more peaceful for you than hypervigilance. Even if there's a part of you that's really scared to let go of that hypervigilance, just meet yourself right where you are. So mindfulness is like a beginner's mind. Those of you who have been to yoga, you may have heard a yoga teacher talking about a beginner's mind. Those of you who have been to AA, to Alcoholics Anonymous, they have a saying that says the most important person in the room is the newbie, is the beginner. Beginner's mind is a fresh mind. It's like how a toddler looks at the world. And a toddler doesn't know how to stress about the past or the future. 
when we're hyper vigilant, we really live from a place of not a beginner's mind, but of a guarded mind. And that guarded mind lives through the past, through the past traumas, through the past hurts, through the past fears. When our mind is in a guarded state, we hold a fearful expectation of what's to come. And we think that that's really smart. Like if I'm on guard enough and I'm watching for anything bad that can happen, then I can protect myself. Can you hear how that really is a logic that comes from our inner child? Because if I look back at my story, at every bad thing that ever happened to me, no matter how guarded I was, no matter how aware that I was, those bad things just kind of came out of left field. Because we can't possibly be hypervigilant enough to keep every bad thing from happening. If we could, then the hypervigilance would work. And we'd feel really satisfied about how that works. And we wouldn't be seeking more healing and more peace. We wouldn't be exhausted as a highly sensitive surviving tribe. We wouldn't be looking to thrive over that survival mode. And that's what mindfulness offers us. When we are mindful, we are present. We are embodying thriving mode instead of the guardedness that hypervigilance brings that keeps us activated and on and exhausted. Mindfulness as a mindset, as a strategy of life, as a tool in healing is solution focused. When we are mindful, we are looking for, hmm, what is the solution? When we are hypervigilant, we are looking for the problem and we are problem focused. Now that's part of why Living from a hypervigilant place is so depressing because we are hyper aware of everything that could possibly go wrong. And do you hear how hard it is if we're living that way to not be depressed by what we see? We actually wind up practicing living life by playing I spy with what is problematic or dangerous or bad. That means all the problematic, dangerous, or bad things pop out. Just like when I say, hey, I spy something green, and all the green things pop out for you. Being problem-focused creates a victimization of life. It creates a fragility, a belief system that says, I'm so fragile, I must always look for what is going wrong instead of coming from a place of strength. Because no matter how different our stories are, for all of us to have gotten to this present moment today, we have survived so much. We have overcome so much. A mindful lens helps us focus on and see our strength instead of fearing our weakness that we won't be able to handle whatever life throws. So mindfulness mindset, solution focused. Hypervigilance as a mindset problem focused. When we are in our mindfulness, we can listen and we can reflect when we're relating to others. When we are in hypervigilance, we're right on the edge of kicking off fight or flight. Those are the two most famous ones, if you will. Then when we're relating to another human being, we are a feathers distance from defending instead of being able to listen and reflect. Now, many of you out there don't know how to recognize the difference between listening and defending. And many of you, I know because I come from such a family system and I've had to do this work, I had to face that the family that I come from only knows how to defend And is very, very poor at listening, at reflecting. So I had to learn, and many of you are out there tasked to learn this very same thing, that what I once thought was just me explaining myself, just explaining my perspective, my point of view, my experience of what happened, is actually a defense mode. And I know many of you hearing me say that right now just got very, very puzzled. 
Maybe you thought, well, then I really don't know what to do when someone starts to have conflict with me because that's what I do every single time. And I've been very puzzled if anybody accused me of being defensive because I thought I was simply explaining myself. When we are in mindfulness and we are grounded and embodied with ourselves, we can listen and reflect. And that looks like being a parrot. So if someone walks up to me and says, hey, Nikki, I'm very, very upset with you. You missed this appointment that we were supposed to have today. If I am in my listening body, then I can just reflect that back if I'm not in defense, just like a parrot would. Oh, my goodness. So you are super upset with me because I missed a commitment. And in that moment, that person is more likely to feel heard, seen, understood. If I skip that step and go into my own explanation, I haven't shown that other person that I've heard them yet, and they're likely to feel dismissed. So defending in this scenario might sound like, oh my gosh, I thought it was tomorrow and not today. I really screwed up. But I really thought you said Tuesday which that's the defensive part. It's coming from a place of me saying, oh my goodness, I didn't do anything wrong. Don't think that I did anything wrong. When we are living in a hypervigilant way, we are hyper aware that we don't ever want to be wrong because we likely came from a system who shamed us if we were wrong. That didn't teach us that making mistakes is natural Making mistakes is how we learn. We all, as human beings, make mistakes, and we don't have to defend automatically every time someone catches us in a mistake. So those of you that recognize yourself and what I'm saying right now, know that this is a skill, and you can practice listening and reflecting, just being the parrot to let go of that defensive posturing. Because doesn't it waste a lot of energy to have to defend so frequently and so often and be on guard, ready to defend? It's so okay to make mistakes in this life. And when you learn how to be okay internally with those mistakes, doesn't mean it's our funnest moment. But when we learn how to support ourselves instead of defend ourselves internally, we waste less energy in that defensive mode. Okay, moving right along. I want to talk a little bit about mindfulness versus hypervigilance when it comes to triggers. Okay, there is a lot out there in social media land because so many people talk about mental health who don't have any professional training in mental health. So there's a lot out there that validates what your ego wants. And what our egos want is permission to stay small and to lean away from our growth, to sort of hide and stay the same because change is scary, it's challenging, and it takes energy. If we're burning up our energy being hypervigilant, we won't have it to heal. Those of you who have taken the boundaries course, you have worked on this lesson with me, that we lean into triggers Yes, some of you are very shocked hearing me say that right now. What I am not saying when I say leaning into triggers is I am not saying lean into what's toxic. And what's online will confound the difference between toxic and being triggered. If I have a history of being bitten by a dog and a big dog runs at me, it is likely that I will be triggered. That makes very simple sense to all of us, right? Now, what I have to evaluate in a mindful, present way is, is this current dog running at me in joy, in seeking affection, or is it running at me aggressively? If this is a dog that I know is kind and reasonable and won't hurt me, then that's a beautiful moment to lean into that trigger. That even when my heart rate starts to get fast, I might get a little sweaty, I might feel anxious. My body might start making sounds like, oh, like just nervous sounds, right? I can take a deep breath and lean in to allowing that dog to come up to me, to petting that dog. And what I'm doing in that moment is I'm teaching my triggered body 
Hey, sweet body, you don't have to be triggered by every dog in the universe just because one dog bit you a long time ago. I can enjoy this animal. Many dogs are kind. I can feel peaceful when an animal approaches me because most will approach me graciously and kindly. The more that I lean into that trigger, what happens over time is that my body learns safety around dogs instead of fear around dogs. And over time, my system will no longer automatically go into a fear response when it sees a dog approaching. That is healing. And people who buy in to what's popular online right now, that you should always be able to avoid your triggers, will be scared of dogs for their entire lifetime if they keep giving in to that trigger. So a mindfulness strategy, a way of being that embodies presence is being able to evaluate what's happening in that moment. And with practice, that gets easier. When we get triggered, it's true that our best thinking goes out the window. We're ready to fight or fly away. That's that's running and hauling ass to save our lives. Or we might freeze or we might fawn. But what we really want in healing is to not have that response wash over us. And we really do have the power to own our experience and to lean in in the ways that I'm suggesting right now. And to learn the difference between leaning in when it's safe while maintaining a permission to lean away if it's unsafe. If that dog looks aggressive or I don't know for sure, then absolutely. I can lean away. I can stand on a chair. I can shut a door. I can walk inside. I can get into my car. Whatever is best for me to do in that moment until I can reevaluate. Leaning away from triggers over a lifetime really gives in to the hypervigilance. It really gives in to the sense that I'm so fragile I can't handle this. Instead of saying to the self, ooh, I don't like this, and I can handle it. It's also currently true that the words triggered and toxic are so overused that they're losing their meaning. So I ask you to give yourself permission to reevaluate from a personal place and a reasonable place what things are really toxic for you versus uncomfortable. Which things are really triggering for you versus uncomfortable at this stage in the game so that you can better conceptualize where you are right now in your healing and what to do for yourself moving forward. When we are living mindfully, we tend to feel an expansiveness. We tend to see through a lens of possibility, of hope. When we are hypervigilant, it's as if our world shrinks. We tend to have a very limited vision of what's possible for us in healing instead of an expansive vision. In mindfulness, we tap into more optimism. And in hypervigilance, we tap into more pessimism. Now, optimism, it's a muscle, you guys. It doesn't mean that you have to be sugary sweet and constantly seeing what's good, what's bright, what's colorful instead of what's dark. I tend to think of myself as a reformed pessimist. I grew up around a lot of negativity, a a lot of problem focus, and a lot of powerlessness and shame. Of course, I grew up with a pessimistic lens. What's important to understand is that This is not our temperament. So many people over the years have told me, oh, you know, I'm just kind of negative. It's my personality. No, it's not. No, it's not. Have any of us ever held a sweet newborn baby and looked at that baby and thought, oh, a little natural pessimist here? No way. Mindfulness helps us lean into our choices in a way that is positive and empowered. If you want a more positive worldview, you can have that. You can practice into it. I have done that in my life, and I promise you it is a better lens than the pessimism that's low vibe and drags us down. 
It is a choice moment to moment in our lives to let go of that hypervigilant pessimism and open up and invite a lighter, brighter optimism. In mindfulness, what we're practicing is called an internal locus of control. And what we know in psychology is that people who practice an internal locus of control have more life satisfaction. In hypervigilance, we tend to cultivate and practice and hold on to an external locus of control. Now, what does that mean? That means that we put our wellness, we put our okayness on external factors. I'll feel better about life when I make a certain salary, external. I'll feel better about myself after I lose 20 pounds. Yes, that's our body that can be considered internal, but that's based on how we look, how we appear. I'll feel better after I attain that, that new car. And, and we do. It feels good to get something like a new car, doesn't it? But external things, they don't last. They don't sort of stick to our emotional bones. So it's fleeting because it feels kind of empty. Internal locus of control is about cultivating that I'm going to be okay with myself based on my internal dialogue, based on me becoming an optimist, me letting go of that internal critic and cultivating an internal cheerleader that lifts me up, that encourages me, that practices patience, and that understands That despite what happens external to me, it is my job to manage my mood and to stay high vibe. I can encourage you to offer yourself a commitment, a commitment that I'm going to spend 2022 practicing being internally solid, rooted, centered, and grounded no matter what happens externally. Those of you who have what I think of as a beautiful stubbornness, when we use our stubbornness to cultivate something like internal locus of control, we're using our stubbornness in its wisest form to help us grow the muscles that will actually bring us relief, peace, and more ease Instead of continuing to hang our hat on what's external, I'll feel better once I get over there, once I hit this goal, once I get a different boss, once my kids get through this phase and get to an easier phase. Internal locus of control has so much positive power. When we are practicing mindfulness appropriately and healthily, we are inviting ourselves to own that we get to deal with and sit with our feelings. When we are hypervigilant, we are working so hard to hide from our feelings, to deny our feelings, to stuff them, to run from them. Those of you who use alcohol to numb out, you're trying to drown your feelings in your present moment. When we are hypervigilant, we are attempting to control all the things that we feel, all the ways that we emote. When we are mindfully with ourselves and present, we're not fighting or trying to control our experience. We're actually working with our feelings, allowing our feelings, being with our feelings instead of fighting for them to go away or to stop or to change or to shift. And that is, interestingly, what allows our feelings to shift so much more quickly if they are funky feelings. Mindfulness is neutral in observation. Hypervigilance is a bracing for the worst. The last thing hypervigilance is is neutral and observational. Hypervigilance is a fear-based state. So it means that we're looking at everything from that place, from that state, through a lens of fear and worst case scenario. Mindfulness isn't about painting everything with a best case scenario, but it is about learning how to be pleasantly neutral 
and curious. Hmm, that's interesting. Wonder why my boss is doing that, huh? Is it mindful observation? A hypervigilant observation is, oh my gosh, I've got a new boss. They're probably going to fire me. Worst case scenario. Hypervigilance doesn't leave room for positive possibility. When we are in hypervigilance, we are in the past or we're in the future. We're stressing. We're anxious about what's already finished happening or what could possibly happen badly for us in the future. When we are mindful, we're present with a more neutral possibility. Hmm, I wonder what may happen. Hypervigilance fights the present moment while mindfulness embodies it. When we are in hypervigilance, we are in the head. Those of you who clench your jaw, who have chronic headaches from overthinking and overanalyzing, you're spending too much time in the head as encouraged by hypervigilance. Mindfulness is a process of sinking into the heart, sinking into the body. Now, that doesn't mean our brains turn off and we stop processing words or language, but it's a quality of less. In some recent episodes and in a recent group of mine, I think I've even done it in one of the live streams on Patreon, I've walked y'all through a little meditation moment of being in the head or the heart. One of my brilliant clients shared that being in the head is like the city and being in the heart is like the country. When we are in our heart space, it's quieter. That overthinking that's pressured from anxiety, from fear, from unknown and uncomfortability with the unknown keeps us in the head and it's exhausting. When we learn to sink into the heart, we give that overthinking a break. And that feels so rejuvenating because many of us have spent way too much time in our heads since we were very small children because we were trying to figure out whatever dysfunction was around us or we were trying to figure out our own high sensitivity surrounded by adults that didn't understand their own emotionality, much less that of a highly sensitive child. Mindfulness says, I have 24 hours every day. Therefore, of course I can meditate 5, 10, 15 minutes every day. Hypervigilance from a place of overthinking wastes those minutes by creating the story that there isn't enough time. I don't know why I don't meditate. There just isn't enough time. I know I should, but I don't. And right there is where hypervigilance screws us over. Because you're stuck in the head, overthinking it. Ideally, if you're next to me and I feel you go through that story, I'll kind of elbow you in the ribs lovingly and go, Hey, stop thinking. Just close your eyes and breathe. Because in the time that that hypervigilance takes to process that you don't have the time, you missed your meditation moment. And mindfulness knows that. Mindfulness does not overthink. When we are embodied in our hearts and practicing mindfulness, we can better shift with ease. Now, that might not sound very important or even very valuable at first glance, but many survivors and many highly sensitive people really struggle with permission to be spontaneous. When we are hypervigilant, we're really trying to control what's coming at us so that we're not spooked or shocked or thrown. So spontaneity is very, very difficult. In my own journey, it was incredibly difficult for me to be spontaneous in my 20s. When we've had some hard traumas sort of come out of left field, those traumas were spontaneous, weren't they? We didn't see them coming, and they shocked us, they startled us, they scared us, they overwhelmed us. 
fast forward many years and the body has learned that. And so we can become hyper vigilant, hyper aware of potential shifts of spontaneous change and we can resist it. We can even think that we hate spontaneity when that really isn't true. We can't evaluate that until we've healed. Now I really love being spontaneous. I'm comfortable with it. That was a process to get to. Mindfulness helped me cultivate a trust in myself that when things shifted, I no longer had to be scared like I was as a child. Because as an adult, I'm no longer powerless. If there's a spontaneous invitation that isn't for me, I can turn it down with ease. And if there's something spontaneous that comes up that is a delight or would be good for me, I can allow it from a place of mindfulness, of self-respect, of care. Hypervigilance really grips our present moment with attention, with a rigidity of expectation, as if we need it to be a certain way so that we don't freak out. But that's just a feeling. It's not true. And if we freak out a few times because we're trying to be spontaneous, that's okay. Our reaction, our struggle, our rigidity can soften. It can't soften if we don't practice. But as we practice, it really, really can soften. And we might find that we actually naturally really love spontaneity like I do. Or you might find that you don't, and that's okay too. But you can't know until this piece of healing is invited, is encouraged, is allowed. When we are hypervigilant, life feels like we're swimming upriver because we're fighting what is. When we are mindful, we're able to kick back and flow with the current. We can float. And when we do so, we can sightsee whatever we're passing by in an enjoyable way, instead of a way that's bracing for something awful. Mindfulness gives us permission to try new things. Hypervigilance helps us become expert at creating excuses to avoid spontaneity or newness or leaning into those triggers, and that thwarts our change and our growth and our self-development process. When we are practicing mindfulness daily, we are trusting that whatever we're going through is figure outable. When we are in hypervigilance, the story that swarms is, but it's so hard, it's too hard, as if it's not figure outable. When we were children, we couldn't have figured it out. But as adults, I promise you, it is figure outable. Even when you have absolutely no idea how or what you got to do, just starting with giving yourself the permission to say, I choose to believe that it's figure outable is a way to be self supportive. And self-calming, solution-focused, instead of fear-focused and problem-focused. Mindfulness embraces what is, and hypervigilance covets ideals and shoulds. I believe this is a big part of why our youth is collectively reporting astronomical depression and stress levels. Because we are very much feeding the younger generation the steady diet of how things should be ideally and not really teaching them how to deal with things as they are. Surely we work towards things being ideal while also holding the reality that we don't get ideals in this life. This may be a form of practicing the good enough principle that mindfulness helps us ground and center in what is instead of what is ideal. Mindfulness embraces and respects the power of this mind that all of us possess. Mindfulness embraces and respects the power of the mind. Hypervigilance disregards the power of the mind 
and allows the mind with great permission to keep going to fear-based places that are familiar, that are comfortable even while dysfunctional. Mindfulness brings our mind to what is useful and positive. Hypervigilance leans into familiar. It allows the inner critic to show up, to keep spewing what it spews just because it always has. It's familiar, but it's not useful. In this way, hypervigilance is a gas guzzler. It's a waste of our energy and our life force. Hypervigilance really becomes like a friend that doesn't really serve us. You ever had that friend through middle school or high school that you knew deep down just was not good news for you, but you kind of didn't know how to break it off? It was familiar. They were available. It was a connection, even if it felt kind of crappy a lot of the time. Hypervigilance is like that friend. Old and familiar, but we start to recognize, oh, if I want a really good life, I got to let this person go. I've got to outgrow this person, this way of being. And it is so with our relationship with hypervigilance. When we are mindful as a human being, we are open to our natural desires. When we are hypervigilant, we are often demonizing our desires. Mindfulness is about being in a state of deservedness and hypervigilance masks the worthlessness that we feel, the scariness that we have felt that has been so big that it has overtaken our existence. That's the only way that it can seem smart to be so exhaustingly on guard instead of putting that guard down to embrace thriving instead of surviving. Mindfulness allows us to be present enough to start to address our inner child, to learn how to calm him or her, to center him or her, to offer him or her more balance. When we do this work mindfully, we lessen our mood swinging. We lessen our reactivity and we can better respond than react. And I don't know about you, but in my own history, those times that I have reacted from a place of hypervigilance didn't really serve me, left me often with a mess that I needed to clean up on top of the exhaustion from the hypervigilant reaction. In mindfulness, we think In hypervigilance, we overthink. Those of you who spend a lot of time confused, we can practice embracing simple truth. If you've ever taken a college philosophy class, you've probably heard the term Occam's razor. That's just a fancy philosophical way of saying, usually it's the simplest answer. Those of you who are currently in abusive relationships, who overthink and overthink and overthink, The truth is, you know, deep down, and you're not confused. You know what needs doing. You're just not ready to do it yet. We can start to notice how our hypervigilance prefers confusion, because as long as we're in confusion, we don't have to hold our feet to the fire to act. And our lives change when we start to act in a calm, simple, mindful way. When we are mindful, we feel connected to ourselves and to humanity, which means we actually feel less lonely. And loneliness is a major modern problem and a particular problem for highly sensitive people and survivors, particularly those survivors who are similar to me in this way, that have such a toxic family that they have moved away from most or all of their family members Hypervigilance has us feeling untethered to ourselves, disconnected. We tend to feel like a helium balloon that's been set free, like we're flailing, lost, directionless, and don't know where we're going or what we can even hold on to. Mindfulness allows us to learn how to hold on to ourselves 
and to our spiritual connection to all the other humans on the planet. Mindfulness takes responsibility for our own well-being as hypervigilance makes excuses for the self. Mindfulness is an assertive way of being. Hypervigilance encourages a lot of passivity or a lot of passive aggressiveness and a lot of people pleasing. Mindfulness matures us and helps us practice ownership. Hypervigilance encourages us to blame our histories, our experiences, other people. Mindfulness embraces our experience and hypervigilance rejects whatever's going on. In mindfulness, we learn with curiosity. In hypervigilance, we often resent. And if living resentfully was modeled for you like it was for me, I can suggest that you genuinely may not know right now how to let go of resentment. But we can learn right now today. We can start that journey. We can acknowledge this to ourselves if this is where we are. That, oh my goodness, I have been living in a way that invites resentment and that that no longer serves me. I don't want that anymore for myself. And in that moment, you are working on this dynamic by acknowledging that to your adult self and for your inner child. You can commit to learning a lighter way of being alive and moving through this life. Mindfulness allows joy. It allows excitement. Whereas hypervigilance puts effort and energy into inviting misery and hopelessness. If mindfulness creates light-filled new patterns of possibility, hypervigilance perseverates on old frequencies, sometimes while trying new things. And the last thing that I want to share is that mindfulness allows us to be guided by fear's wisdom. Yes, I'm saying fear's wisdom. When we are hypervigilant, we are constantly scared and activated, which means we really cannot evaluate, see, or process the wisdom of genuine fear. If I am scared of every single dog that runs up to me, I can't appropriately discern which ones are kind and safe and which ones are aggressive and potentially unsafe. There's a life-changing book. It changed my life. It's called The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. When we are mindful, we get to be guided by the wisdom of true fear. In hypervigilance, we are thwarted by constant fear's overwhelm, and we can't make heads or tails. This is why mindfulness brings us to actual more safety and security in our real human lives that have risk and in our relationship inside of ourselves with ourselves. None of us were meant to live with daily fear. If you struggle with anxiety, if you struggle with PTSD, if you struggle with loneliness, if you struggle with negativity, mindfulness is a freedom button. It is an invitation and a permission to notice yourself and the world through a gentler, more realistic, healthier lens than one of constant fear and activation. Your nervous system, your heart, and your body deserve to learn how to feel grounded, calm, and self-respecting. I hope there's something in this episode that helps you see yourself, that helps you hold yourself with more clarity, more soul care, more self-love, more understanding of the zoomed out picture of your life so that you can better take care of yourself every single day. We're just starting this year. Imagine if every single day you could dial down the hypervigilance just a little tiny bit and dial up the embodied peace that you were born to have. 
I am so grateful to be part of this community, to be starting another year of healing, of wholeness, of growth, of shedding and letting go of what no longer serves us, of committing to internal locus of control where we practice thriving no matter what is happening external in our personal worlds and in the larger world. I want to invite you to come join. If you've been a long time listener, maybe this is your year to join. Come join Patreon. It is an easy, low stress community where every month I do a live stream on a topic. The very next topic is going to be drugs and alcohol. Come ask me whatever you want. I was a French Quarter bartender to get through school, you guys, and I have an addiction specialty. We live in a world with tremendous availability of almost any vice you can imagine. I am of the camp at this point in my career that addiction is less of a disease and more of a part of the human condition that we can all benefit from learning how to balance. If you're interested in coming to hear me talk about drugs and alcohol, You can come join the Patreon and ask a question. It's a live stream Q&A that we do once a month. When you sign on, you will get access to every single exclusive episode that is only available in the Patreon. I am a little bit more intimate in there when I share because it's just, it's a little smaller community. It feels a little more cocooned and safe so I can be a little more personable. The last Exclusive episode we did on Patreon was actually a video episode where I got to show you some of the things that are in my office that I surround myself with. One of the things that you get when you sign up for Patreon and support us and your support keeps the show commercial free. So I want to thank these Patreon supporters of the show. You get a shout out. I want to thank Rose, Amy, Mama on a Mission, Kirsten, Shireen, Lauren S. from Louisiana. Hello, sweet woman. I want to thank Anne, Miss Liz, Stephanie, Mary, Carol, Vivi, Lynn, Maurice, Jessica, April, Joel. I want to thank Cassie, Jim, Tammy, Bree, and Alicia. You guys, we cannot do the show without y'all's help. You at Patreon are our backbone y'all help us produce this show thank you for helping us spread emotional badass all over the world let's make 2022 the most grounded thriving year of our lives light and love i'm an emotional badass you're an emotional badass and together we are where moxie meets mindful light and love Bye bye Mm-hmm.